telling me that one of them, they were going to have two, but one of them was canceled? I don't know. All right, so I guess we can get started. started. Um, so Yuji will finish up his lectures on uh, anomalies and topological phases. All right, thank you for coming back. So let me continue my discussion from two days ago. Um, so the last time we talked about anomalies of finite group in zero plus one dimensions and how it is cancelled by the contribution uh, from the bulk two dimensions. So let's first slide, uh, discuss the case of anomaly of finite groups in 2D where things are only a bit more complicated. So that's supposed to be example five or exhibit five in the contents I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. Um, right, so anomalies of finite group G in 2D. So the strategy is the same. You use a defect, so, so now the space-time is two dimensions, right? And use, use a defect such that if you cross it, uh, you experience a group action by an element G in capital G. And uh, these defects can merge, right? So the G wall and the H wall can merge to form the GH wall. And uh, if you have three walls, they can merge in two different orders. G, H, K would merge to G, H, K. And uh, there, another choice of the order of the merger. So, we saw exactly the same graphs in my lecture two days ago. And in that lecture, we were talking about 2D a bulk theory, which cancels the anomaly on the 1D boundary. So the 2D theory was non-anomalous. Here, 2D theory itself is anomalous. This means that these two ways of merging the walls can have a slightly different effect in the partition function. So this can have an additional phase, G, H, K. Now, this G, H, K is not completely random. Is this the second blackboard? Ah, yeah. So drawing is a bit more complicated than in the two-dimensional case, sorry, in the one-dimensional case. I, I think Max or Xi'in uh, basically did the same analysis, but uh, it's a nice exercise, so let me just repeat. Uh, right. Yeah, you, it, I can easily confuse myself uh, <laughs> the way the orders are supposed to be changed. So let's say you have four walls labeled by GHKL merging into the single wall for the element GHKL, right? So suppose you want to compare this particular ordering and that particular ordering. So to get from here to there, you can choose two different ways of uh, using these elementary steps, right? Uh, if you carefully follow exactly what you're doing here, uh, you first 
apply this elementary step to this uh, part. So this gives you gh k l. And then uh, you are applying the operation to here. No, not there. <laughs> it's very easy to call. Yeah. You're applying the operation here. This gives you h alpha of g, h, and kl, right? Similarly, in this part, you're applying that elementary operation there. So this is the g, h, k. And then to go to here to there, uh, you are moving this intersection point to this. So this gives you alpha g, h, k, and l. And finally, you have alpha h, k, l, because you are dealing with this, this part. But these two operations should give the same answer. So this gives you a, a certain constraint on the possible choice of alpha, which is alpha g, h, k, l alpha g h k l uh, which should be equal to alpha g h k alpha g h k l and finally alpha h k l so this is the equation and uh, people often say that this is the pentagon equation another way to say it is that as max told you uh, you can define the cohomology, I mean, diff operation on the set of inhomogeneous co-chains, and this condition just means that this delta alpha is trivial. So that's how the group cohomology is associated to the anomaly of this 2D uh, finite group, and this analysis extends to arbitrary dimensions. The next thing we ask is how such an anomaly uh, is accounted for by coupling this anomalous theory in two dimensions to a three-dimensional bulk. So the figures are harder to draw. Uh, So you, you want to attach something. And if you have two walls, G, H, and K on the boundary, um, this group operation needs to be represented by a domain wall inside the 3D bulk, which is very hard to draw. I'm a very bad at drawing things, so I'm not sure how much it helps <laughs> to draw these things. I mean, it's, it's totally ununderstandable. <laughs> but uh, you have one wall here, right? And the second, second wall there, second wall there, and the third wall here. You see, you don't understand anything with this. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and uh, so again, the bulk theory is the ungauged Dijkdijk-Witten theory, and uh, that cancels this phase. So let me try for about three minutes to draw the correct <laughs> figures <laughs> to take into account that. You see, um, the, so the situation in the boundary is not too hard to draw. So you originally have this diagram. And you'd like to change that diagram to this, right? Uh, now I'm going to attach the bulk. Let's see how well <laughs> it goes. I mean, yeah. I think I shouldn't add these bounding boxes. I mean, it's just com complicates things. So please imagine that there's a three-dimensional bulk attached to it. And uh, let's see. So, so the final configuration I keep 
to be just, I mean, these what I mean. I have an artistic suggestion. Yes. Draw the same figure that's on the boundary. Yes. Translate it into the bulk and then just connect those with horizontal lines. Ah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe I should <laughs> switch places with <laughs> him to, <laughs> to, to ask. I mean, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so we, we connect them, right? So this is the situation, right? So on this side, asymptotically, on the far right, well, nobody likes far right, but uh, <laughs> 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 um, um, so you, you connect, you want to connect it, right? So this, e this one is easy to connect. This one is also easy to connect. And uh, bottom part is not too hard to connect, right? But there, in, in, but this point is harder to connect. So what happens is that this point should gradually move up, and at some point, you hit this middle point and get to the other side. Thank you. This makes it very easy to draw what's going on. <laughs> so let's see what exactly is happening at here. So you have a four-valent intersection here. So what's going on is as follows. On the boundary, because of this rule, this side has an additional factor of alpha g, h, and k, right? On the other hand, on this side, the rule of the engaged digraph witness theory says that for such a special point where four walls merge, you assign additional factor alpha g h k in the bulk. So if you consider the combined system of the boundary together with the bulk, uh, you have exactly the same factor on both sides. So this makes the partition function of the con combined system to be well defined without any ambiguity. So what is a consequence? Let's say we consider the simplest case of g equals z2, right? So in this case, there are not many types of walls. So let's say this is the non-trivial wall. This is the trivial wall. And uh, the only type of non-trivial uh, way of combining three walls is this, you, you, use, you start from three non-trivial walls and end up with one tr non-trivial wall. So these two are the examples of that change of the ordering of the merger. And you can work out what are the possible solutions to that Pentagon equation and basically the choices you have is either you don't change the phase or you change the phase. So that's the anomaly of Z2. So if you are happy with discussing just the domain walls, then that might satisfy you. But for a tra more traditional person like me, you would like to see, I would like to see some more concrete uh, outcome from this fact. So let's say you have a two-dimensional theory with Z2 symmetry and you put it on a torus, right? And uh, you want to include 
this non-trivial wall oops, going upward. I mean, I, I take the time direction to go up, and you have a wall. So this is this eval evaluates a trace in the twisted sector, right? Because you go around the spatial circle, you get this Z2 operation. And uh, so let me just write here what I just said. So this is a twisted sector trace of exponential minus beta h. And uh, mm, right. Now you perform two T transformations inside SL2Z. Right. And T transformation moves this domain wall. So the way it moves the domain wall is that on this side, you have this, because you, I mean, you twist it in this way. And uh, you move it in the other direction if you do another T transformation. But now, you use that rule up there. So you just have a look at this internal point, internal circle. So the way you reconnect the lines here and lines there are exactly as in that rule. So these two configurations are different by a factor of plus minus one. So these two are the same when Z2 is non-anomalous, but they are different by a factor of minus one when the Z2 is anomalous. Now you remember that this is, of course, trace of exponential minus 2 pi i p, exponential minus b, beta h, and this is trace of exponential plus 2 pi i p, exponential minus beta h, where p is, as always, L0 minus L0 bar, right? So this means that 4 pi i p exponentiated gives you plus minus 1. This means that p, which is L0 minus L0 bar, is one half some integers if non-anomalous, and uh, it's in fact half integer plus a quarter if it's anomalous. So that's what you get. So this will make it very easy for us to come up with an example of Z2 symmetric theory in two dimensions, which are both for, for both cases of non-anomalous Z2 and anomalous Z2. So what are the examples? So of course there are many non-anomalous theories. But uh, let's just consider, uh, I mean, a compactified boson. This is a favorite example for all of us. So we, we are considering 2D compactified bosons. And of course, I mean, so the parameter is theta. And there is a Z2 transformation, which just flips the th value theta. And uh, this is a standard part of the uh, course on basic string theory to analyze this Z2 orbifold, right? And there you learned how to quantize the system in the twisted sector. And, uh, you know, in the twisted sector, 
bosons are quant I mean expanded into these half integer modes. Therefore, by acting on the vacuum with this half, half integer modes, you get L0 minus L0 bar, which is half integers. So that's exactly what you get. So um, this, this case is non-anomalous. So what would be the, an example of an anomalous Z2? Um, we know that we can perform the T-duality on this compactified boson, right? And that corresponds to uh, just flipping one out of the left movers and the right movers. We learned in the textbooks that T-duality usually changes the size of the circle. However, on, at the, at the self-dual radius, Uh, this operation of just flipping one of the one out of the right movers and the left movers is a symmetry because the t duality keeps the radius, right? So, so this is t duality. Is a symmetry. <coughs> symmetry, and there's a very nice paper in last recently, about a year ago, by Greg and Jeff Harvey, with a very nice title called "Uplifting Discussion of T-Dualities," and there they noticed, or they re-emphasized the fact that T-Duality is an order of four operation. Another way to say that is that the T-Duality, which is Z2, is an anomalous Z2. So there are two exactly the two same way of referring to the same fact. So what, what is going on is the following. Um, so you see in the untwisted sector, um, U1 symmetry of the rotation enhances to SU2 at the self-dual radius. So um, the one example of untwisted sector field is something like exponential of i square root of 2 theta l z in some normalization, which I don't specify. And, and it is very well known that this guy has l0 plus 1, right? So that's the normalization. I mean, you have additional current operator, which have l0, 1. And uh, in the twisted sector, you know that the twisted sector field corresponds to this operator, because at the self-dual radius, flipping, th flipping the theta is equal to the half shift. So the coefficient here is half. But this means that because the dimensions, scaling dimensions are proportional to the square of this momentum, this dimension is one quarter, right? So this means that if you consider the system, or this system on the torus, where you have a t-duality twist around the spatial circle. You might not consider this kind of weird situation very often, but let's consider that if you go around the circle, spatial circle, you get t-dualized. That's a bit weird, but you can consider that. This means that left movers, say, are in the twisted sector, and right movers is the untwisted sector. And because of that, L0 bar, sorry, L0 minus L0 bar is given by, for example, 1 quarter minus 0, right? So which is 1 quarter, just as I said on the other side. So this means that T-duality, if you regard T-duality as a Z2 symmetry, it's as an anomalous 2D symmetry, given 
uh, corresponding to that minus sign. So let me just mention that there's also another way to conclude that this T duality wall, T duality operation is anonymous Z2. So the way you do is to directly compute the phase appearing here. So it can be done by realizing these, op these line operators in terms of fairly, something called fairly indeed line operators, which is obtained by inserting these um, <coughs> operators and moving it around. Then you apply various OPEs and uh, you read off uh, <coughs> these coefficients by a careful, careful uh, computation of the fusion. I'm not going to do that in front of you because it's far more complicated than this way of computation. But uh, for more complicated symmetries, sometimes using this approach might be easier. So I'm just, I just wanted to uh, briefly mention that there are other ways to compute. So, um, so I just told you that uh, Z2 symmetry in 2D uh, system can have these two types of anomalies, non-anomalous or anomalous. Now, <coughs> some of you might be thinking uh, what I just told you seems contradicting to what I told you in the first few lectures, right? I discussed the eta invariant for an extended amount of time, and there I discussed the case of a Majorana fermion, right? So it's very similar to the situation I just discussed. Instead of considering this t-duality of a compactified boson, I already discussed the case of a single Majorana fermion and the action of this minus one only on the right mover, right? And uh, I said that in this case, you attach, you attach a bulk, bulk system, which is a ratio of infinitely massive fermions in 3D. And in particular, I used a rather large amount of time computing the eta invariant of this system over this uh, length space, S3 over Z2, this non-trivial Z2 bundle. And it turned out to be 1 eighth, right? So the anomaly is not order 2 like this. The anomaly was order 8. And uh, one ma another manifestation of this, as another manifestation of this, I told you that if you consider exactly the same way uh, to the system on a cylinder with this Z2 line passing in this direction so that if you go around the spatial circle, you experience this Z2 uh, action we saw that L0 minus L0 bar is one quarter, sorry, one half integer plus one sixteenth, right? So instead of one quarter, you get one sixteenth. Um, so how can this be possible? I just told you in the first few minutes of this lecture that for that the domain walls are represented by this this way and uh, rearranging should satisfy the pentagon equation and th that phase should be just plus minus one. But clearly, unless you take four copies of it, that doesn't fall into that paradigm. So where, what was wrong? So a short answer is that I didn't take into account the effect of fermions and spin structure in, in the very beginning of today's lecture. Um, <coughs> 
Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to carefully discuss how the Fermionic case can be understood diagrammatically, but let me just mention one large difference, one big difference between the Fermionic case and the Bosonic case. You see, as always, we come back to the situation with a single Z2 line here. And you have uh, fermions on this side and fermions on the other side. So this is 1D, sorry, 2, 2D. And we would like to consider massless 2D Majorana fermion because you'd want to consider the Z2 operation. But for the moment, let's go back to the situation where we consider massive 2D fermions, right? So you say you have massive 2D fermion with M positive, but because we now add the mass term, non-zero mass term, this system is no longer Z2 symmetric, and therefore you have this uh, negative mass on the other side, right? What did we learn in the previous lectures of mine and by Max and by Tom de Grand? So if you have a fermion with mass, in a space with position-dependent mass, such that the mass changes the sign, what happens is that you have a Majorana fermion zero mode, right? Majorana fermion zero mode. So it's kind of subtle, but even after taking this mass to be zero to go back to this original situation of this Z2 line in the Z2 line in the presence of plus zero mass and the minus zero mass, you need to think that this Z2 defect line has a single Majorana fermion zero mode. It's kind of a weird point, but uh, this makes this domain wall kind of like the boundary of a Kitaev chain, right? So this is the fundamental difference between the domain wall in the bosonic Z2 symmetric theory and the domain wall, Z2 domain wall in a fermionic Z2 symmetry with this anomaly 1 16th or 1, one eighth. So what happens is that you need to dress. So when you analyze the Pentagon equation, for example, and to see what happens if you, when you change this to that, you need to take into account the presence of the Majorana fermion zero modes on these lines on this side and these lines on the other side. And you know, fermions, uh, behaves rather strangely under the rotation and the reconnection. You need to specify various additional data. And that allows you to put some more complicated phase there. So that's how these things arise. Uh, these things can arise, right? <laughs> so that's how fermions affect the symmetry classification. Yeah, so that's, so, so I, I explained a bit more about this in the lecture note I attached to the wiki of the TASI 2019. So if you want to know more, uh, you can read it and you can read references uh, cited there. So, but uh, it would take too much time if I do that right now. So I'd like to uh, conclude these examples and uh, I'd like to move on to a slightly different discussion. Uh, so it's a good point if you, if, if any of you have questions. Is it fine? Yes, please. Um, how do I think of the zero mode from the sort of CFT operator viewpoint? Ah. The question was how 
we should think about this additional fermion zero mode? Um, that's a good question. Mm, it's kind of um, I don't have a good answer. That's the very honest answer. Um, one way to see that this zero mode arises is to go back to this original example, I mean, very easy example of the fermionic, I mean, Majorana fermion. So we are considering this Majorana fermion in a sector where psi L is periodic, but psi R is anti-periodic, right? So you need to expand Majorana while fermion in the NS sector and the R sector. So in the NS sector, you can easily expand it, and uh, you get psi uh, one half plus n, right? On the R sector, sorry, this is the other way around. And uh, on the other side, in the periodic sector, the, it's expanded in integer modes. You see that uh, canonical conjugate of psi plus n is psi minus n, right? So they are paired, but, now, but you run into the problem of having this single Majorana zero mode, psi zero. So that's how you see that there's a ma single Majorana fermion in this case. So um, it's not perfectly correct to say that you have a zero mode localized at this defect, right? Because it's clearly not true. It is localized when the mass is non-zero, but if the mass is zero, I mean, it's not localized. But the presence of this zero mode manifests itself if you consider a more complicated topology like this. So somehow this defect has a power to create major and a zero mode, which complicates the quantization whenever the situation is right. So that, and this happens uh, for any CFT with this pr property of the anomaly. Yeah. So when you cross the, the Z2 line, do you now also act with psi zero, or is that not the right way to think? Um, so the question was, uh, if it's co correct to think that if you cross the wall, we should act by this psi zero or not, I don't think it's the correct interpretation. But uh, yeah, I don't really know. Yeah. Any other question? OK. So now I completely switch gears and uh, discuss some fun operation you can do in 2D again, but with non-anomalous Z2 symmetry. So we just saw that anomalous Z2 symmetry is a bit complicated, right? So I prefer simpler systems. So let's say we consider 2D QFT, and let's say bosonic, right? Non-spin theory, QFT Q with non-anomalous Z2 symmetry. And let's put it on a cylinder. And you can consider the twisted sector and the untwisted sector. So this is the Z2 line. So we have the Hilbert space of this theory Q in the untwisted sector, and also the twisted sector. And because we have this Z2 symmetry, you can split this Hilbert space into the Z2 even sector, the Z2 odd sector, and that can be done in both the untwisted sector and the twisted sector, right? Now, we already discussed this operation a bit, but we can gauge this Z2 to obtain a different gauge, a different QFT. So 
we consider the gauged theory or orbifold theory. So let's call this orbifold theory Q prime. And the Hilbert space of this theory Q prime is obtained by keeping the Z2 even sector, right? Of both untwisted and twisted sector of the original theory. Twisted plus um, and now you realize that in fact this orbifold theory has a new Z2 symmetry which assign which under which this part is even and this part is odd. This Z2 symmetry is in fact a symmetry of this orbifold because in this original orbifolded setting, um, the number of twists are conserved modulo 2 because if you take the OPE of two twisted sectors, of course you get untwisted sector, so it's exactly how Z2 is conserved. But this means that uh, you can consider twisted sector in this orbifold theory by this new Z2 symmetry. So you say that this is untwisted sector. And I guess I should come back to using white chalk. So a twisted sector of this gauge, gauged theory or orbifold theory is that you just take uh, all the sector from the original uh, Q twisted minus, right? So again, this comment that this is even applies to both up and down and they are odd for both these cases. And now you can try orbifolding this theory Q prime by the new Z2 symmetry, right? So this is Q orbifolded by original Z2 orbifolded by the new theory. But uh, please just have a look at the blackboard there and blackboard here. Um, the untwisted sector, untwisted sector of this doubly orbifold theory is obtained by keeping the even sector, right, of this theory, which means that you keep uh, that one and this one, which means that the untwisted sector, untwisted sector of this theory is just the original untwisted sector of the original theory. The same is true for the twisted sector, and it turns out that this theory is the original theory. So this is an interesting fact about non-anomalous Z2 symmetry in one dimension, sorry, two dimensions. So I explained what is going on th at the level of the Hilbert space, but let me discuss what is going on at the level of the partition function. So, so let's say you consider a partition function of the original theory on a spatial manifold M2 with a background gauge field, Z2 gauge field. So this just means that you are considering uh, cohomology in Z2 coefficient, and it's just a fancy way of saying what happens if you go around various cycles. So this just specifies whether you get plus one or minus one if you go around various cycles. So that's encoded in this object V. And uh, uh, 
Oops. Oopsie. So what? The partition function of the orbifolded theory. What's the partition function of the orbifolded theory? So as you know, when you gauge, you sum over all possible gauge background, and uh, you sum over all possible choice. And you need to include some normalization factor, which depends on the genus. But I told you that this gauged theory has a new Z2 symmetry. So you can couple this to a new Z2 background, which I denote by W. So this is the gauge background for the new Z2. And the factor you introduce is just minus 1 to the power M2 of VW. So this is just a, I mean, um, if you are not familiar with Z2 valued uh, cohomology, you can think of them as basically ordinary differential forms and uh, not much difference happens in this simple case. So you just take degree one differential form and you multiply and this is degree two so you can integrate it and you, you get either zero or one modulo two and this becomes plus minus one, right? So that's this the formula. And, com and conversely, you can write this you can extract the original partition function by performing the Fourier transformation again, because this is basically a discrete Fourier transformation. And when you first learned Fourier transformation formula in your undergraduate class, you get very confused by the relative plus minus sign, but because this is minus one, you don't have to care about it, so which is a nice feature here. So this is Q over Z2, <coughs> M2 and W, right? And you see that the equation is perfectly symmetric between the two operations. So this tells you in yet another way that if you get Q over Z2 from Q, then you can perform another Z2 quotient or all folding to get back the original theory. So this appeared in HEPTH, uh, originally in a paper by Varfa in 1989, and things were not called HEPTH back then. But uh, in fact, this phenomenon goes all the way back to Kramer and Varnier in 1941. So I'm talking about extremely old stuff, as I announced in the first lecture. So what did Kramer and Vanier did? So they, he, they considered uh, the Ising model, right? So Ising model, on a, let's consider Ising model in the square lattice. So you have spin variables arranged in a square lattice, and this is Z2 symmetric. Right? And you can consider a Z2 wall. You can consider a Z2 wall where if you insert it, you force the spin to flip. And we, we learn in the basic uh, statistical mechanics course that you can think of the end point of such Z2 wall as something called the disordered field. But this means just that this disordered disorder variable is, the twist, is in the twisted sector of the original uh, Ising model. And we learned that you can rewrite the partition function of the Ising model uh, in terms of the disordered field. And that, so a modern way to refer to this is that you start from the Ising model at uh, parameter beta and you take the Z2 quotient, and it, it becomes the IZ model with the dual temperature, right? So that's the way you say. And you know that this operation is a self, I mean, duality operation, so that 
you can perform the same operation on this side, and you get back to the original point. Um, so in particular, when beta equals beta prime, sorry, beta twiddle, uh, this becomes a self-duality. I should emphasize that this is a rather special property of the Ising model, right? In general, if you perform the orbifolding or the gauging of Z2, you get from one theory a different theory. But in some cases, you get back the original theory, uh, sometimes a completely the same theory, and sometimes a, a theory which is continuously connected to the original one by varying the parameters. So there's something special about this Ising model, and what is that particular special property. So I'd like to say a few words about it if I have time. But I'm afraid I'm, I don't really have that. Yes, please. Ah, uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> These are minus. OK. Uh, right. So let me give it a 3D interpretation. So the common theme in my set of lectures is that phenomenon can be, in D dimension, can be sometimes better understood by considering the system as a boundary of a one higher dimensional theory. But here we are, I, I emphasize that this Q has non-anomalous Z2, right? So you don't have to put the bulk, but it's perfectly OK to put the trivial bulk, right? Trivial Z2 symmetric bulk, which is kind of a stupid operation. But you can consider gauging, gauge only the, the bulk. So you don't gauge, so I discussed gauging the boundary, but here I'm talking about coupling to the trivial bulk and gauging just the bulk. So this gives you the original theory Q coupled to pure Z2 gauge theory here. <coughs> So what's the property of this Z2 gauge theory? Um, it has a Wilson line in this Z2, I mean, e, non-trivial representation of Z2. This is usually called line M, E. And also, you have a Tohoft line, which you call M such that if you go around this Tohoft line, you get this Z2 operation. So these are the basic two line operators. And uh, so so let's say we have a non-trivial boundary, non -trivial boundary with a non-trivial topology, and you have a path, non-trivial path there. And we consider this as attached to the 3D bulk with this pure Z2 gauge theory. And for the moment, let's think that this time flows in this direction. And then you can insert this Wilson line operator around this, so around this path B translated into this time direction. And then you can also consider <coughs> Wilson line operator around a different cycle, right? So they act on the Hilbert space defined on this spatial slice. And uh, this operator E and line operators E and M has this property that you get a minus sign if you reorder 
we order it just because this is uh, all this is all done to z2 and this creates a z2 uh, <coughs> defect so this means in this operator language that line operator wrap, wrapped around a and line operator wrapped around b has the commutation relation that uh, times minus 1 a wedge b i mean a wedge b right so what you do is the following You can start from Q over Z2, the dual theory, with its new Z2 symmetry coupled to, I mean, trivial bulk with Z2 new symmetry and gauge only the bulk. So this gives you a setup where Q over Z2 is attached to a pure Z2 hat, a Z2 new gauge theory. But if you carefully think about it, I mean this Z2 new gauge theory also have line operator E new and M new but uh, the point is that there's a duality in this pure Z2 gauge theory exchanging the Wilson line and the Tohoff line because the commutation relation is exactly symmetric. Yes? Let's go back to the Straubel for example for a moment. Can we generalize it in higher dimensions like this? Whenever you gauge a Q from global symmetry, you get another global symmetry? That's right. So the Yes, uh, the question was if this property of uh, double gauging generalizes uh, in higher dimensions. The answer is yes, but uh, if you gauge a p-form symmetry, typically you get uh, dual symmetry, which is a higher form symmetry. Yeah, but then you need to re-gauge that higher symmetry to get back to the original theory. But in two dimensions, everything is simple because everything is usually zero form symmetry. So coming back to what I was discussing, when you want to compare this and that, the thing you, we need to do is that you identify this Wilson loop operator of this side as the Tohoff loop operator of that side and the way around on the other side. Let's say old. So what this boundary does and how do we understand this oper double oper double gauging operation in this language so we come back to this commutation relation uh, This means that they don't th all commute. So what we learned in Q quantum mechanics class is to consider a maximally commuting subset. So you can take, you can diagonalize, can diagonalize all the Wilson loop operators or A and B, right? And you can pick a basis such that this has the value a v. So this this is the common eigenstate for all of the Wilson loop operators, and the eigenvalue is specified by this v, right? And similarly, you can consider the common 
eigenstate for all of the Wilson loop operator. in this way. So you can work out what is going on so now you consider the system such that uh, you have ungaged all the Z2 symmetry on this boundary and ungaged new Z2 symmetry on the other side but in the bulk but in the bulk you have pure Z2 gauge theory for old thing, which is equal to pure Z2 new gauge theory, right? So you can consider such a system. And uh, that we are not uh, summing over Z2 means that we are diagonalizing this Wilson line operators. So the state here is labeled basically by EV and the state here situation here is specified by MW and uh, you can work out the inner product by comparing two set of eigenstates and this gives you just the pairing between the two labels specifying the boundary condition so this gives you a new interpretation of the way to obtain ah, I somehow kept this very important equation right at the right on the blackboard where I'm going to draw a new equation you see um, you see you start from this original theory Q right this is Z2 symmetric and now you attach to this, this slab, this slab of 2D gauge, 3D gauge theory with the boundary condition preserving Z2 on this side and new Z2 on the other side, right? So this contributes, so this is specified by some value E, V, and this part is specified by M and W. Now you attach this theory Q onto this side of the boundary and you sum over uh, you sum over V. You gauge V here. So you just push this slab onto this theory Q and voila, you now have new Z to symmetry. So you get the new theory. And what's the partition function of this system? Well, this part provides this partition function. And this slab gives you this partition function. So this gives you a new perspective on this gauging process where you attached a slab of 3D theory onto this 2D uh, theory to get a new uh, to the theory. So some of you might be familiar with similar operation in supersymmetric field theory where you talk about duality walls uh, acting on 3D supersymmetric theories and this is in fact in, in, in a sense the simplest toy model where you can analyze duality walls in a very simple way. So in the remaining 10 minutes I'd like to mention Another interesting fact about this system. You see, this Z2 gauge theory, in fact, has a third set of operators. E itself is a Z2 line. So if you have two E's, you get a trivial line. The same is true for M. 
But you can consider E and M running parallel, right? And this line is usually called <coughs> F. Why is it the case? Well, let's try twisting this thing 360 degrees. And again, I'm very bad at drawing, drawing things. But uh, let me try. So you get something like this. So this is the outcome of what you do after 360s rotation. But now there are two, jun two junction points. And you use that rule to straighten them out. At the cost of multiplying it by minus 1. This means that this combined operator f is in fact a fermion. Right? Correspondingly, correspondingly, there is an operator we can call LF of A, which is LF of A is just as a definition, it's, which is LE of A and LM of A. This has this. Yes, please. Ah, if you change the crossing twice, in fact, you, see, you are still get twisted. You can draw the figures very carefully. I mean, so the question was, why I get just one sign, right? So let me just do this on, over the blackboard. You just change the ordering once, right? Now the white line is over the red line on both sides, so you can just slide them to get back to this. So this fermion line satisfies a rather strange commutation relation, right? So it, it has this weird commutation rules that it behaves at the same time as both electric and magnetic, right? So you wouldn't usually think that you can simultaneously diagonalize them because they don't commute. But in fact, you can diagonal, diagonalize it in some sense. You can diagonalize it in some sense. Because of the following, um, so let me just gi give you the answer first. So suppose you have a 2D surface. with spin structure, structure sigma, right? Then you can say that LF of A, F sigma, is diagonalized using this formula where this sigma A is 0 or 1 for NS sector, for the R sector. So you, you, you know that R sector is more complicated than the NS sector, right? So you want to assign zero, ordinary zero to the NS sector and the complicated one to the R sector. And the only thing I need to explain to you is that this assignment satisfies that funny commutation relation. And in, in fact, it does. I don't want to explain it in detail, I mean in the general case, but let me just give you the simplest example. Uh, so let's say we have the torus, right? And uh, let's say we have periodic spin structure here, periodic spin structure on the vertical side, and of course the diagonal direction is also periodic. But all of them are 
R in the R sector. So let's say this is A and this is B and this is A, a plus B, right? Then um, then you see, ah, I think I'm sam saying something wrong. But you see, the point is that the value you want to assign, sorry, I realize that what I wrote is here is wrong. I mean, if you compute this, I don't think you get, yeah. What you get is this. Sorry, LFA plus B is this. I'm very sorry about that. So what happens is that all of LFA plus B, LFA, uh, uh, F minus B are minus 1, right? And so in order to get this value, you want to multiply this and that. But multiplying two minuses gives you plus. So you need the correction factor, and it's take, taken into account by the intersection number of this direction and the other direction. Yeah. So this is how spin structure provides a simultaneous diagonalization of this set of variables. And uh, what this tells you is the following. I'm kind of running out of time. So originally, we started by talking about Z2 theory on the boundary coupled to trivial Z2 a bulk with a line operator corresponding to E, right? And then I considered Z2 new symmetry coupled to a trivial Z2 new bulk whose line I would call M. And we said that gauging both of them, the bulk theory, Z2 gauge, gauge theory is equal to bulk Z2 new gauge theory, but there's in fact the f another choice such that you start not from a Z2 symmetric theory, but rather from a spin theory, which has a spin structure line coupled to trivial spin bulk, right? And then you sum over the spin structure in the bulk. So it's just so, so, so in fact, this thing is also can be said as bulk spin, pure spin gauge theory, right? I don't know if that's the correct terminology, but it's like gauge in Z2. You just, so in the case, case of pure Z2 gauge theory, you just sum over Z2 background field. Here, you just sum over z2 spin background. What this means is that you can consider this operation, right? But on this side, on, so originally, I considered ungaged z2 here and ungaged z2 new here to get this operation of gauge in Z2. Now I consider ungaged Z2 here, and I consider ungaged spin structure here, right? This sounds a bit more exotic. This gives you, this is specified by F sigma, right? So you can do the, you can play the same game of starting from Z2 symmetric theory and smash it with this slab, with this boundary condition, and you sum over the 
Z2 gauge fields on this boundary. So what does it give you? The end result is a theory which depends on the spin structure. So let's call this theory ZQ twiddle. Now this depends on the spin structure sigma and you can read it read its partition function as follows. So you have original theory which re responds to V and I forgot to tell you that this inner product gives you minus 1 to sigma V. I mean this is the only sensible p pairing you can consider. So this is this is it. In, and of course, you can do the other operation. You can take a spin theory and attach that to get the Z2 theory. And in fact, this, is, this operation can be inverted, which is a spin version of the uh, Fourier transformation. So you can do this. Um, so let me summarize what we got. Uh, ah, thank you. So this is sigma. So well, we have an equation already, but we can summarize it also in words. Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm going to finish. Um, so this theory is a spin theory. And this theory was a Z2 symmetric theory, right? So to get the Z2 symmetric theory from the original theory, you sum over spin structure, right? And uh, this is basically the GSO uh, pro construction projection. So it's a sum over the spin. And there's an inverse construction which creates for you a spin theory from a Z2 symmetric theory. This is, in fact, a generalization of jordan Wigner transformation. So if it if this is the Ising model, which is Z2 symmetric, you know and you have learned in your class that you can rewrite it as Majorana fermions. <laughs> and that's what you have on this side. But uh, what this extremely general analysis tells you is that this conversion between Ising model to uh, Majorana fermion is not just specific to this case. Um, in fact, it's a very general operation which, can, which you can do to any spin theory or to any Z2 symmetric theory such that uh, uh, sum over the spin structure can be, in, can be reversed by uh, summing over the Z2 gauge field. So you now learned that GSO projection and the jordan Wigner transformations are the inverse operations to each other. And uh, let, me, let me just make another remark. So, what was so special about the fact that this, in the case of Eisen model, you get the Majorana fermion on this side, right? But uh, in this case, Eisen model was self-dual under the duality operation, right? So, so that operation sent Q to Q over Z2. And easing model was the fixed point under this operation. So what happened, what, what corresponds on this side is that Majorana fermion had a Z2 uh, symmetry under which under which this was related in this way, right? Uh, by the multiplication by the alpha invariant as I repeatedly mentioned. So, 
And I told you that this is a manifestation of this one-eighth anomaly of this Z2. So there are two Z2s appearing, too many Z2s appearing here. But I just wanted to say that this operation of gauging this Z2, if you map under this jordan Wigner verse and GSO projection, becomes this Z2 operation of multiplying by the R invariant. And the fact that Eisen model was self-dual on this side corresponds to the fact that the Majorana fermion had an anomalous Z2, such that if you apply the Z2 transformation, you get multiplied by the R invariant. Um, if you want to know the details, it's written in my lecture notes. And there was, in fact, a, a recent paper by David Thorne, not from this week, but from a few months ago, where this procedure is detailed. So thank you very much. Yes. Is there any interesting structure if you consider like Z and orbitals? Um, we can do, uh, yeah, more. I, I, I think we are the stuffs. <laughs> but the question, problem is that uh, it's. I mean, spin structure is like a weird version of Z two, right? But it's harder to consider weirder versions of Z n. But. Um, this type of analysis can be done in many other si situations with different symmetries. So you can start from a 2D theory with some certain symmetry, and you couple that to the bulk, and you consider it's gauging there, and you just you take a different basis, and you can go to the other uh, description. And that can be done for really um, diverse examples. Yeah, so it, it vastly generalizes just this case of triality of original Z2, new Z2, and the spin structure. Because it can be done for any line operator in the bulk. Yeah. More questions? If not, let's thank you, Jigen, for the whole series. Of thank you very much.